Also, each of today's three sessions will be followed by a five to 10 minute Q&A. So please be sure to put your questions into the Q&A area of your console as they come up so we can get them answered for you by our experts. And during today's third session, we will be giving away high-end Bose noise-canceling headphones. But you must be present to win, so be sure to stay on for the entire event. Finally, we do have resources from our sponsor, Veeam, available on the console right now, so please download and check those out. It's because of Veeam underwriting this summit that we can bring you this great content, so we thank them for supporting the community and ask you to check out those resources so we can bring you more events in the future. Now on to the first session of today's summit, AWS Cloud Ransomware Threat Outlook. This session features Carlos Rivas, an AWS certified DevOps professional. Carlos has a background in software development, and he has worked as an independent cloud consultant helping migrate California community colleges to the cloud. He is currently an AWS instructor, and you can find his work on LinkedIn Learning, Cloud Academy, and Udacity. Carlos, it's great to have you here. Please take it away. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. And uh, before we move on from this slide, I wanted to point out that my uh, LinkedIn uh, address is there. So if you have any questions around cloud computing, DevOps, I'm more than, than glad to help um, as always. Uh, that's why I do this presentation and that's why I chose uh, uh, instruction as my current uh, career path. So yeah, if you have questions, outside of the scope of this presentation, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Moving on, um, this is what we're gonna be talking about in this presentation. Um, I'm gonna concentrate on cloud architecture uh, mainly in, in the beginning uh, because um, I believe that the foundation of, a, you know, it's, it's good to have a very solid foundation in the beginning when it comes to security and, and networking and all that because if you start uh, solid, you have less thing to worry about uh, down the line, including, of course, uh, ransomware and any other uh, active threats that may uh, prevent your application or environment from being uh, uh, secure and stable. Of course, uh, we can't talk about uh, this without mentioning backups and disaster recovery, so we will touch on those as well as we go along, because you know, once you get your data encrypted by a ransomware attack, uh, hopefully you do have a, a plan to re revert that and you know, possibly say, okay, don't worry about those guys, we'll just go to our disaster recovery plan or just go to our latest backup and just uh, forget that, right? Uh, hopefully that's uh, your reaction if and when that happens to you. And of course, at the end, we'll have our usual uh, Q&A. So let's dive right in. So um, it's hard to talk about AWS these days without mentioning the well-architected framework. This is essentially, uh, this is gonna be your baseline when you're uh, in AWS and you start growing, all of a sudden you have uh, one account, then two, then three, all of a sudden you're using AWS organizations and now you have a significant mess on your hands. Uh, that's where the well-architected framework can uh, help you there. Uh, by definition, it is uh, essentially a collection of uh, best practices that will help you design reliable, secure, and efficient systems uh, in the cloud. So essentially, all the best practices that you can possibly have in AWS, they, you know, they get collected into this uh, framework that you can deploy and use. Essentially, uh, actually I have an architecture a slide that I can show you. Uh, essentially, um, best practices around operations, security, reliability, performance, and costs. Uh, you know, those things, uh, in our perp uh, for our purposes, we will concentrate mostly on uh, operations and security uh, for our conversation today, but just know that the well-architected framework covers uh, other areas as well. This is the, the architecture uh, that I mentioned. Essentially, you use uh, something like AWS Control Tower to deploy a management account, which is what you see uh, on top here. And in that account, you will have 
AWS single sign-on to manage all your credentials from one location. Uh, that, that one is very, very important because uh, something like a ransomware attack usually starts with compromised credentials. So having uh, centralized management for your credentials is key here. Uh, AWS organizations is also another one of those tools that can help you centralize and, and manage all uh, the rest of your, of your uh, AWS account uh, footprint from a single uh, location. You have other uh, services as well, such as a service catalog that can help uh, your users deploy services without requiring uh, experts all the time to get it done. Uh, code pipeline, which even though it sounds like a, a software development tool, it can also help you deploy uh, infrastructure as well. Uh, so that, that, that's why you see it here. And of course you have uh, what we call an account baseline is where you have a collection of best practices and, and things that need to be in place uh, for any and all future uh, accounts that are going to get deployed in this environment. Usually you'll have a request from a developer saying, hey, I need a sandbox environment so I can uh, test my application as I develop it. And yes, you can do that, but it's always wise to start from a baseline so that you don't just provision some random account with all kinds of superpowers and then this developer, you know, has access to things that, that they shouldn't have access and, you know, and, and that could spike your costs and or expose your environment to uh, potential threats out there in the network. Uh, beyond that, you will have a deployment of uh, standardized accounts. That's what you see at the bottom here, uh, share services, log archive and security. Uh, within those accounts, you're going to have uh, specific items and, and those items only. Uh, of course, with the purpose of helping you manage uh, your environment. So not many people in your environment should be able to uh, access uh, these accounts. For example, especially the, uh, the log archive and the security account should be very, very uh, restricted uh, for that reason, right? You don't want uh, somebody logging into your account and deploying some, some software that could be you know, a ransomware uh, application that's going to start encrypting things uh, against you. Um, of course, because if they do that, the first thing they're going to look for is to look perhaps for a log archive or something like that to be able to delete, you know, their footprints it, so that you'll never know they were in there, right? So that's why these accounts should have their own, you know, security credentials completely isolated from everything else. The same for uh, the same goes for security as well. Share services is going to be your day-to-day uh, -day, uh, system operations. This is usually where you deploy something like uh, domain controllers and uh, uh, DNS resolvers and applications of that nature that get, uh, that get shared across your entire uh, AWS footprint. Let's move on from this slide. Let's talk about specifically about operations uh, within the well architecture framework. Essentially, uh, by definition, it is the ability to support and run workloads effectively and gain insights into the operation, uh, meaning that, you know, it doesn't get measured, doesn't get improved. So uh, operations in involve not only running your applications and keeping them uh, stable at all times, but also making sure that you're monitoring and measuring to, in order to improve. So what are the best practices here? Uh, performance operation as code. I am a big uh, proponent of this uh, practice. So if you're going to deploy a server, it's best to have a script that deploys servers in AWS as opposed to clicking your way through a console or perhaps uh, just doing it a, a, as a one-off type, type of thing. It's best to have predictable code that you can uh, change as needed. Uh, this way, for example, if you want to have your, all your storage volumes encrypted, for, uh, for example, it's very likely that you could forget it uh, down the line if you're doing this, you know, three times a day all the time. Uh, but if you have it in, in predictable code, uh, which could be anything, uh, these days there's so many options. I'll give you a few names. Uh, Terraform as, as, as one tool that can help you write infrastructure as code. Uh, CDK or the AWS Cloud Development Kit is another great tool and that's my tool of choice these days. Uh, what else? Uh, you could write CloudFormation uh, to perform, uh, like I said, uh, infrastructure as code. This is uh, like the original, when it comes to AWS, that's the original one, CloudFormation. 
Uh, so yeah, you have your scripts ready to go. Somebody comes in with a request saying, hey, I need a Linux server. You already have a script for that. You, that way, you know, it's going to go out there in a predictable manner. Another best practice uh, for operation would be to make frequent, small, and reversible changes as opposed to deploying a, some huge infrastructure out there that's going to put your infrastructure at risk of downtime, you know, like deploying some uh, big routing change. Uh, that's, those are usually dangerous uh, because the only way to test it is to actually put it out there and, and make it happen. Uh, so it's best to just do it a little bit at a time as opposed to making like massive changes that could affect uh, uh, server deployments or infrastructure in general. Another thing is to always uh, anticipate and assume failure. Uh, that's also very, very important. You never are going to be thinking, oh, yeah, this, this is going to be five minutes on a Friday afternoon. It never is. You, you know it. it. It never is five minutes on a Friday afternoon. So don't do it on a Friday afternoon. Make those changes when everybody uh, that is a key uh, player is available. Uh, so just assume things will fail and have a rollback plan on hand. And of course, learn from failures. Uh, AWS is, is, is not like you're hiring uh, Amazon employees to manage your environment. You're still responsible for your own environment. So whenever there's a failure, it's good to learn so that it doesn't occur again in the future. Um, this is uh, what it looks like uh, from a, a services uh, perspective uh, when it comes to operations. So as I mentioned, CloudFormation is something that you would be using a lot. In fact, if you write CDK code, it gets turned into CloudFormation before it's sent out to AWS to build uh, your services. AWS Config is also going to be a very important tool for you because it's going to keep track of changes in the environment. Again, very important to ransomware attacks because Config can keep track if something uh, changed. You know, a server, all of a sudden you have two or three additional servers in production. It's like, what's going on here? I didn't deploy anything. Uh, the way to detect that is using something like AWS uh, Config, for example. And of course, when it comes to monitoring, you have uh, CloudTrail, you have CloudWatch. Those tools will help you with real-time monitoring of what's going on uh, within your AWS environment. And you can set up alerts uh, to your cell phone or, or operations email, for example, to alert you like, hey, you know, somebody just logged in with root credentials, you know, that's, that's dangerous, right? So you might want to send alerts when things like that happen. And if you use, as I mentioned, uh, this uh, framework, those practices are already baked in. So it's just a matter of using them, just setting up your emails and, and uh, mobile phones and stuff like that, and it, you will get those alerts as well. Now switching to security, but still uh, within the uh, well-architected framework. Security is essentially is the uh, a collection of recommendations and best practices to protect data and system and to control access and to be able, of course, to respond to events. Uh, that's very, very important. Uh, it starts with managing uh, identities. As I mentioned, if you use something like AWS SSO or single sign-on, uh, that's a good first step because that way you have everybody assigned to a specific uh, IAM role or identity role that they can use. And then, of course, it's just so much better than having uh, just random users creator, uh, created at request, right? So if somebody says, hey, I need a new user. Well, uh, your new user is going to have to fit into one of these uh, particular roles. So that, that way you know which permissions they're getting. Of course, I don't need to tell you that what happens when you give somebody full administrator access, that could be a bad thing. So you want to try to avoid that if possible, uh, especially in, in production environments, right? So uh, something to keep in mind there. Uh, security also covers uh, anomaly detection. Uh, as I mentioned, if something gets deployed and you didn't, you were not deploying anything, you have to know within minutes or, or seconds that something uh, just got deployed to your, uh, to your environment. Uh, Something like AWS Config can certainly help you uh, detect things there. There's other uh, avenues of detection. For example, if you're creating Docker containers or just uh, writing code in general, there are tools that are look uh, for uh, vulnerabilities and compare your code to those uh, known vulnerabilities and give you alerts uh, as needed. 
uh, data protection. That's a whole conversation in and of itself. Because uh, in this case, we'll be, we, we would be talking about uh, encryption and uh, not only at rest, but encryption uh, in transit. And that's also a, a good uh, thing to keep in mind there. Because you have, uh, you know, SSL encryption to protect, you know, from the client to your service. But then when your data is stored, perhaps in your database or the volumes in your server, you also need the secondary encryption, which is the uh, at rest. And that, you know, AWS has services for, for all that stuff. So. Now, when it comes to protecting your infrastructure, now we're talking about active real-time threats. Uh, I could name one. It would be, uh, you know, denial of service. Somebody just hitting your web services just to intentionally, just to make them crash. And for that kind of protection, you know, there's also software out there. There's uh, AWS Shield, AWS uh, Firewall Services, and things of, of that nature. And of course, it's always good to have an incident response plan, which includes, you know, making sure all these tools are enabled and, and knowing uh, what to do if things uh, get triggered. Perhaps you consider switching to a different region and shutting down your main region. That's called an, an active active in, in disaster recovery, but we can get into that a bit later down the line here. And this is uh, the famous slide that you probably have seen uh, a thousand times over. This is just a reminder that even though uh, you're in the cloud, that doesn't mean that you don't have any responsibility when it comes to protection of your environment. So just because you are now in AWS, that you know, you're still responsible for making sure that your servers have uh, all the ports that need to be blocked that are still blocked because uh, AWS protects you, uh, protects the cloud, you are responsible for the security of in the cloud. So like I said, if you have a Windows server, perhaps, perhaps it's not wise to allow a remote desktop connection to this Windows server from a public IP address. Uh, for example, you want those things, you know, tied down to your local network, perhaps maybe allow your on-premises and network to get in there as well. But those things are your responsibility. So the emphasis on, on this particular slide is just to remind you that there are still some steps that you have to take care of uh, yourself, and Amazon will not do those uh, uh, that protection for you. You have to uh, set it up yourself. So what services uh, would I consider when using, uh, when considering uh, security in the cloud? Well. It starts with uh, those uh, that I mentioned, uh, which is uh, directory service, or this is kind of referring to SSO as well. Uh, organizations, this is to allow you to deploy uh, service control policies across your entire account footprint. So for example, as I mentioned, that developer that has full admin rights to his own environment, but you can deploy uh, a service control policy using organizations to restrict what they can do uh, within their account, uh, for example. IAM is always going to be in here, which is Identity and Access Management. And that one is going to help you create those policies and roles uh, that are going to allow you to restrict every person that accesses your, your network, whether they come from SSO, whether it is an IAM user, or more importantly, whether those are um, API credentials. Because uh, sometimes we get lazy Let's say we deploy a third-party tool, and this third-party tool requires certain permissions. So we don't want to bother having to create a policy for this uh, one tool. So we just give it full access to AWS and provide the credentials to this tool so that it can access uh, our accounts. Um, in those cases, well, uh, yeah, it's okay. Most of the time it's okay, but then you know, if those uh, credentials are compromised, it could get nasty very quickly, especially if the tool has legitimate uh, full access to your environment, because you'll be thinking that, hey, this is this is actually uh, legally happened with the environment. This is nothing wrong. So your even your alarms may not detect anything wrong uh, in that case. So be careful with that. Just assigning uh, full admin keys or, or users uh, when using IAM. Okay. Um, for, for detective controls, I have CloudWatch and Trusted Advisor. CloudWatch has a, a machine learning based uh, anomaly detector. So for example, if network activity increases all of a sudden, you can get an alert for that. 
the same goes for you know like your servers are behaving weird you know like all, all of a sudden you have like 100 percent cpu spikes that are not normal and you could get alerted for that uh one example would be that you have servers out there that are being used uh, to mine cryptocurrency, for example, and you're not aware that this is happening. Uh, you could have an anomaly detector say, hey, you know, all this uh, CPU is being used and we need to understand why. So this uh, CloudWatch can help you uh, find those using anomaly detection. Uh, the trusted advisor is more of a, exactly what it sounds like. It's just an advisory service that tells you hey, you know, this machine is under provision or this is over provision. So you could save money here by, you know, right sizing this compute unit, for example. Uh, things of that nature you can learn from trusted advisor. I mentioned uh, uh, real-time infrastructure protection, and this includes uh, the web, web application firewall, uh, shield uh, for denial of service attacks, uh, VPCs, well, VPCs, of course, it goes to networking, which is a, an entire conversation on its own to do proper uh, networking in AWS. Uh, guard duty. Guard duty is also very important, essentially just uh, another tool, another one of those tools to manage and check for active, uh, unusual activity in your environment. Now, when it comes to data protection, this is what I meant by uh, at rest uh, data protection. So. The services that you see here include uh, KMS for uh, encryption or key management service. Uh, Amazon Massey is, is a service to look at your uh, files in S3 and make sure that there's no uh, PII in there. So for example, if you have a, a file that you just exported from outside from a database, all of a sudden this file has all personal information from your customers. Uh, you want to get an alert that that file is there and it should be uh, removed if it's, if it's not supposed to be there. So the way to get those alerts is to use uh, this service. And of course, incident response. Uh, that would be those alarms that I mentioned that you can set up for, for CloudWatch and then SNS to get those alarms as soon as possible delivered to emails and mobile phones. And of course, uh, CloudTrail, um, when I think of CloudTrail, the first thing that comes to my mind is an alarm that detects anybody logging in with root credentials to your environment. Those are absolutely uh, very, very important. Uh, you need to manage those very, very carefully, okay? Now, Inspector is, is uh, at the application level. So if you, have, if you are developing software and you don't want to you know, use some library that you download it from the internet and you didn't realize that there's a vulnerability associated with that library, uh, you can use a service like uh, Inspector to check uh, for those, okay? Uh, fortunately for us, there's something called the Landing Zone Accelerator, which is a, a really fast and efficient way to deploy everything I just mentioned with just uh, installing one piece of software and a, and a few clicks. Uh, essentially, this solution, what it does is um, <clears throat> it combines, as you can see here, 35 plus AWS services, and essentially it deploys the well-architected framework framework for you uh, in a fast and efficient way. This is essentially a, a CI/CD pipeline that you set up, and once it's going, uh, it takes uh, quite a bit of time to complete. But once it's done, you have your environment uh, fully set up and ready to go. Uh, just as you saw in the uh, architecture slide. That's a really uh, great solution. I decided to include this uh, screenshot here. This is what, what it looks like, uh, one of the um, configuration files for the uh, landing zone accelerator. Essentially, you just go through a file that is uh, formatted like this in, in YAML format, and you just enable or disable services as needed. The same for accounts. So if you need to create a new account, you just put it in there and say, hey, you know, this account needs to be under this organization and that, and it's just a text file. You change it, you save it, and it will go behind the scenes and do the work for you. It's a really uh, great tool to save you a ton of time when deploying uh, the well-architected framework. Uh, this is uh, what it looks like, the, the architecture for this uh, particular tool. Uh, essentially, what it does is it starts with a... Uh, of the CloudFormation script, and that's going to deploy um, uh, a little uh, code commit repository 
and, and code pipeline. And what it's going to do is going to go to GitHub and get this, the latest source code for the landing zone accelerator. And then it's going to fire a uh, code bill, which is essentially just deploying everything uh, step by step. It's going to create accounts as needed. It's going to create uh, your security account, your log archive, all, all, everything that needs to happen uh, to have your environment fully set up uh, with the tools that I just mentioned earlier. Uh, this will do it uh, essentially automatically for you. And of course, it can help you uh, update as you go along. So, you know, new things will come around and then you can just uh, rerun this particular CICD pipeline and you'll keep your, uh, your baseline. It will be uh, always up to date. So really, really a great tool to save you a ton of time. Uh, this is where you can find the, the Landing Zone Accelerator. It's available on GitHub. You just go to github.com and then go to um, uh, the AWS Labs account. And then in there, you'll find the repository called Landing Zone Accelerator on AWS. Moving on to backups. Uh, backups, of course, uh, I had to talk about it because we're talking about ransomware attacks and usually the the most uh, wise thing you can do when it comes to protecting yourself from ransomware attacks is to have regularly updated backups. Uh, AWS backups is the first thing that comes to mind uh, in, in this case, because essentially all you do with AWS backups is, first of all, you set up a plan, and then you tag uh, your servers as needed. Some of them you know, need to be backed up every hour. Some of them uh, once a day, so you're fine, and, and you know it, it really depends on the sense, uh, the urgency of the information, the sense of sensibility, and uh, yeah, you just set them up and with this tool. and And I keep mentioning servers, but uh, AWS Backup supports all these other uh, storage units. You can say EFS, you know, EBS volumes, uh, EC2s, RDS, uh, DynamoDBs. So essentially, pretty much. All these services you can just set up to on a, on a backup schedule using this one tool from one location. And what I like about these tools is that um, you have the option of locking uh, your data, even protecting it from yourself, uh, which is really essential when it comes to um, ransomware attacks. So let's say that you're shipping out uh, these backups to a different region. Of course, if an attacker doesn't know that, you know they, they're gonna say, okay, we got a, a ransomware set up in your environment. You lost this, this or that database. And all you need to do is say, no problem, change passwords, shut it down, and then just go to your backup, which may be in a different region, perhaps even in a different AWS account, which is going to require a different set of credentials. And that's usually the very best way uh, to protect yourself uh, because uh, usually the, uh, the attacker may not have the credentials to the other account. That's I believe the, the name of that concept would be uh, air gap, right? Because, you know, they need to jump over another uh, obstacle to get there, and they, of course, cannot uh, encrypt your data on the other side unless they also have those credentials. So, yeah, AWS Backup can certainly help you uh, protect against those attacks. If AWS Backups is a little bit too much for you, uh, there's another a cheaper, slightly simpler solution, which is the Amazon Data Lifecycle Manager. In this case, uh, now I'm talking about servers, specifically about uh, EC2 servers, because those servers, uh, you know, let's say that that's all you have, you know, a couple of web servers, perhaps a database in there, uh, a few, a handful of machines, this tool can help uh, with that. It's essentially a scheduler inside the, um, the EBS volume uh, console. And you can just set up a regular schedule uh, to back up uh, your your uh, your volumes there. As I mentioned, you can do it at whatever frequency uh, uh, that you need. But of course, as I mentioned, this doesn't have all the features I just mentioned for AWS Backup. This is just a simplified uh, solution uh, if you feel like AWS Backup is too much uh, for what you're currently doing. Um, this is a storage gateway. This is another service by AWS. And the only reason why I put this here is uh, because you may have your entire deployment uh, on premises. And then something like a storage gateway can help you, you know, bridge that gap into the cloud and say, hey, you know, if 
I want to protect my on-premises network from ransomware attack. Well, the best way to do it is just, just to ship out all your information to the cloud. So this way, it, you know, if somebody breaks into your uh, local environment and, and, you know, catches you off guard with a ransomware attack, your data is off-site. It's going to be essentially off-site. You can put it out, ship it out to AWS just by simply deploying the storage gateway. Uh, what it does is, it helps you deploy uh, endpoints that are local to you in your uh, local environment, but it's essentially uh, a way to pass the information over to uh, S3 in AWS, uh, for example. So you would have a, a volume or an appliance, as you say, in, in your environment, and anything you back up to this one place is essentially getting uh, you know, chipped out to AWS through your network uh, from there. So, like I said, something happened. This is great, not also not only for ransomware, but also perhaps as a disaster recovery option. So, if something were to happen to your local uh, network, then you have the ability to jump over there uh, to the other side of, uh, to AWS and say, "Okay, no problem. You know, something happened here, but my backups are safe uh, on the AWS side." Okay. And a third-party solution, it would be very similar to where I just described. Essentially, you have your on-prem network, and in this uh, scenario, it's essentially the same. You'll have some sort of agent or appliance running in your network, and then all the, your data gets uh, transferred and translated to, to, send, to send out to, uh, to S3. Essentially the same thing. So when you recover, it's the same, the, the same process occurs at, in reverse. So even if you're not ready to uh, migrate to the cloud or use the cloud at all, this is a great starting point. So like I said, something happens in your local network, don't worry about it. Just your data is gonna be safe in Amazon uh, S3. And then whenever you're ready to revert back, you know, just uh, you know, fix your network, change passwords, restart your servers, and then uh, restore from the cloud back to on-prem. Glacier is something that I have to mention, but um, that's usually uh, the slow type of solution. So if you have like really tight uh, recovery times, this is probably not the option, uh, Glacier, uh, but it is cheap. So if, if you're talking about uh, dozens and dozens of terabytes of information that you have to take care of, uh, this is probably the cheapest uh, solution in that case. So yeah, you would do something like this and uh, yeah. It's essentially the same thing as S3. It's just that it's a whole lot cheaper, and it comes with the penalty of you know slow recovery time. So it's, if you needed something to happen right now, like oh my God, we need to recover right this second, uh, you may not want to choose Glacier in that case. Okay. So let's talk specifically about ransomware. I have a couple of slides uh, to talk about it, starting by um, a definition. Uh, ransomware is essentially a uh, a way to uh, to to encrypt your data and un unless a ransom is paid, <clears throat> essentially saying, okay, we have this encryption key that you don't know about. We're going to go into your environment. We're going to take your your files or your database. We're going to run this encryption process, and then once the data is encrypted, it's essentially useless um, if you don't have the the encryption key, right? So. Uh, it's something that you really have to take seriously. And this is something uh, I found while I was researching this presentation. And as you can see, this is not something from the past. This is not something from you know 10 years ago or 2020. This is something from, from right now. Uh, this is something that's happening all the time. So this is something that you need to take uh, seriously and, and protect yourself against this potential attacks because they are happening all the time. Usually the most uh, common sense of solution to ransomware attacks is to do an air gap. An air gap essentially is a way to uh, be able to send information one way, but the information cannot travel, travel back the same way that it went in. So in this air gap environment, let's say that you're shipping out your backups to this, uh, uh, to this, this place. Uh, from there, uh, there's pretty much, uh, nothing to worry about, hopefully, meaning that the attacker would need additional credentials to be able to go to the other side of the air gap to be able to fetch that data and, and you know, cause damage there as well. So like I said, this is the most uh, common sense solution 
to ransomware, just pull the cable out of the computer. So, uh, this is what that looks like from an architecture uh, perspective. So if you have this uh, firewall or air gap or whatever you call it, uh, you want to have that to be you know, covered by actual you know, firewall appliances, load balancers, um, authentication mechanism, anything that you can put in between the attacker on the, uh, the protected side, uh, you should put in there in place because uh, that's, that's going to be your best bet. Encryption. Uh, encryption is, is a very interesting conversation because what I hear from, from people is usually, well, even if my data is encrypted, uh, a ransomware attack can still occur and encrypt my data. So I still you know, like, what's the point of encryption in that case? Uh, well, what I would say to that is that if your data is encrypted, it's good. You just tell the attacker, well, we're not gonna, we're not gonna pay anything, do whatever you want. We're just gonna uh, refresh our network, we're gonna uh, change our passwords, we're gonna redeploy everything. Uh, and you can sleep at night knowing that unless your attacker has access to the encryption key, they cannot steal your data, right? Because one thing is to, um, to steal your data. Another thing is just to uh, threaten you with, uh, with the ransomware encryption, right? Uh, you have to consider both. So I will always prefer to deal with a uh, doubly encrypted data uh, above over the, uh, the possibility of somebody walking away with the data and then possibly selling it and, you know, ruining my business. So yeah, encryption is always, that should be uh, top of mind. Just make sure that you do it like that should be a default, right? That's why I mentioned infrastructure as code, because that way you, you'll never forget to encrypt the, the volumes on any particular drive, because that should be your go-to default at all times. Uh, this is uh, using K, uh, KMS. Essentially, uh, KMS is the, the go-to solution in AWS for encryption. You can you could argue that you have more uh, aggressive solutions like Cloud HSM, which is more on the on the physical side of things, like actual physical keys. Um, but yeah, KMS uh, should be enough uh, for our purposes in order to, uh, as I mentioned, really just protecting our data, right, from from those uh, malicious eyes. So, what can you do uh, right now to protect uh, your network? Well, you have uh, to worry about uh, password rotation. That's, uh, that should be a given. And uh, the well Architected Framework can help you with that, you know, giving you alerts that, uh, not only alerts, but also enforcing that passwords are changed uh, regularly. And this also, go for, uh, this also goes for API keys, because we always forget to change those passwords for the, the you know, third-party API tools. Uh, so keep that in mind. And as I just mentioned uh, regarding encryption, uh, when in doubt, just encrypt it. I know that, yeah, encryption is another layer, so it's going to perhaps affect your overall performance because now, like I said, it's another layer that you have to worry about. But, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry. So always, uh, when in doubt, always uh, encrypt. Uh, number one, when it comes to ransomware, is to keep those backups up to date. That way you don't have to worry about finding millions of dollars to pay, the, you know, to those attackers. Just tell them, you know, do whatever you want, and then you just go to your backups as long as they are up to date. Finally, I'd like to mention the, um, the air gap, as I mentioned. Uh, that's something you can do, uh, whether it's ideally, you know, you have another account that is not even tied to your AWS organization or your environment, and you're chipping your backups to that account. This way, if the account, uh, the account is compromised, the credentials are compromised, the attacker may not have uh, access at all to this uh, air-gapped uh, account where your backups are. So again, more peace of mind uh, to you in that case. So those are some best practices that you can start implementing right away. And with that, if there are any questions, I'll be glad to help. Okay, great job, Carlos. We do have some reader questions. And before we get to those, I'd like to remind the audience that we can take questions up until about five minutes to the top of the hour in order to give you a short break before the next session. So please send them on in now. And let's go to the Q&A console, Carlos, if you want to follow around the first question from 
Breeza in the audience is kind of a long, involved question, so if you want to look at it while I read it to the audience, and then we can hear your thoughts. Sounds good. Breeza says, he's asking about step-by-step remediation actions. He says, do you have any knowledge base or documentation that can be shared which highlights the best practices and common violations or non-compliances with the step-by-step remediation actions. Unfortunately, AWS Docs does not have a full step-by-step guide. What do you have to say about that, Carlos? Yeah, the thing about AWS not being specific is that it's, it's a very broad uh, type of question because you know we're mentioning ransomware uh, here today. Um, I also touch on, on denial of service attacks. So there are so many different ways where your uh, environment can be breached and your data uh, can be stolen. So it would, given a, a step-by-step guide would be like very, very specific to one person because, you know, somebody may have an attack come from their on-premise network, from their own network uh, locally. It could be from a, a public IP address. You know, you have all these various options, so you can't really uh, nail down a specific uh uh, step-by-step guide because you know you wouldn't you would need to know all those things like okay like how did this did this happen do we have uh, security groups in place are there no security groups at all uh, you know do you have these ports that are open to the world where, where they should be limited to the local network only uh, for example is encryption enabled so there's so many uh, variables uh, at play here and operating systems and things that are always evolving so that's why it's it's uh, if you had a step-by-step guide, it would have to be a specific uh, to your uh, to your environment, to your uh, type of incident that you want to manage. So. Okay, great. And let's move right along. Next question. Hey, and hey David, I'd like to comes. jump in here. Um, I see that um, uh, we have. Um, uh, let me see if I can pull this up here so I can show you. There's a, a playbook provided by AWS in there. You know, I mentioned the AWS Labs GitHub. There's another GitHub that is called AWS-Samples, and there should be a, a playbook in there, AWS Incident Response Playbook in the AWS-Samples GitHub. And, and I'd like to uh, thank Stephen for that. He just uh, posted that in the internal chat. Yes, thanks very much, from Stephen. We'll be hearing from here la- from him later. Good information there. Okay, next question comes from Neil in the audience. Ransomware is the subject, as it so often is. Neil says, since ransomware is on the rise, do we need to worry about AWS Secrets Manager being compromised? Uh, AWS Secrets Manager, uh, it's it's something that I use pretty much on a daily basis. And by default, it uses uh, KMS uh, encryption. So if I had to worry about it, it would be more of uh, um, a conversation about access. So as long as you tighten down your access to your, um, to your secrets, let's say that you have an application that needs a password, uh, only provide access to this one secret to this application. So if that application is compromised, uh, the attacker will not have access uh, to, let's say, to your database, for example, or to all your, all your other secrets. So the, the best practice here is to limit, uh, on a secret-by-secret secret basis, the permissions to Secrets Manager. That, that should keep you safe. Okay, good stuff. Here's a question about the complexity of the AWS landing zone, Carlos. We know you're an AWS certified DevOps professional. And here's a question it asks, do I need to be a DevOps engineer to deploy the AWS landing zone? Uh, that's a great question. Um, it is a fairly easy to deploy the, uh, the landing zone accelerator. Uh, the problem is when things go wrong, if, if you don't have uh, some sort of uh, experience with AWS, especially, you know, around uh, DevOps and CloudFormation deployment and those things, uh, it may be uh, intimidating or hard to troubleshoot at first. So, yes, uh, that 
can absolutely uh, happen initially. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's recommended that you have at least some knowledge around uh, DevOps in order to uh, attempt an, an AWS landing zone accelerator uh, deployment. Okay, great stuff. And I'd like to remind the audience to please send in any questions you have. We have about 10 more minutes for questions. And Carlos lives and breathes this stuff. So this is a great opportunity for someone to get some expert one-on-one -on -one discourse from a certified AWS certified DevOps professional. And the next question, Carlos reads, how can I protect my data from software vulnerabilities coming from the libraries that my developers use? Uh, in that case, the number one tool, I believe, is called AWS Inspector. Um, there's also another alternative. So if you're generating, uh, say, Docker images, for example, uh, you can just uh, place those images in the uh, ECR or uh, Elastic Container Registry. And when you put them in there, you have the option of uh, enabling uh, scanning, and it will check uh, your your layers, your container layers against uh, known uh, vulnerabilities. So yeah, you have those two options: inspector and just uh, if you're if you're into Docker images, then you can you can do that as well. Okay, there's a question from Lynn. Can you provide examples of real-world ransomware incidents in AWS cloud environments and the lessons learned from those situations? There must be plenty of examples out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, usually uh, from what I've heard, and, and I've seen it happen a couple times, it involves the compromise of uh, root credentials. Those are the most uh, sensitive pieces, pieces of information that you can have uh, in the AWS environment. So anybody that gets a hold of root credentials can pretty much cause all kinds of damage uh, in your environment. So yeah, that's usually when, when I hear about an attack uh, in, within AWS, it starts with uh, something along those lines. In fact, uh, AWS, uh, I believe they enable multiple uh, MFA or multi-factor authentication for, for root. So now, for example, you could do, you know, if you're gonna log in as root, you, you may be required to look at two different cell phones, for, for example, to provide uh, the MFA token, uh, uh, you know, as an option. And highly recommend it if you have like a very sensitive uh, production environment in AWS, you know, protect those credentials like crazy. Then, you know, they're not needed for anything other than maybe setting up billing and, and things like that. So those are like very, very sensitive pieces of information. So, and as I mentioned, the well Architect framework has an alarm that tells you, hey, somebody just logged in with group credentials. So yeah, I would you know, just be careful with those and, and you should be fine. Okay, great. This is another landing zone, AWS landing zone question. Can the AWS landing zone accelerator meet my specific security requirements? And if so, how? Uh, yes, they have um, additional deployments, uh, not deployments, they have additional like databases of best, best practices that you can integrate into the landing zone accelerator. So let's say, for example, that you're in the medical field, perhaps you're a, a dental profession or a hospital or something like along those lines, you can deploy, uh, you know, HIPAA-specific uh, uh, rules and settings for the landing zone accelerator. So yeah, it, it can get very specific. I've seen that, and, and I also seen another one for uh, education, cause, which is the, the field that I'm, I'm currently working on. Uh, so yeah, you can you can do all those uh, directly from there. So not only best practices in general, but they can provide you with best practices that are uh, industry specific as well. Okay. Good information. There's a question from Lisa, but uh, you know, keep in mind this is a sponsored event, and we can't get into too many other vendor names. But she's asking about what tools are available for performing software hardware integrity and for detecting unauthorized changes. And maybe we don't want to get into specific names about that, but can you speak on that space generally, Carlos? Uh, well, uh, what we can do to answer is just stay within the world of um, uh, AWS. 
And as I mentioned, uh, AWS Config is a tool, is a very uh, simple, relatively simple tool that you have access to uh, in there uh, without having to resort to uh, third-party vendors. And uh, this tool uh, will help you detect pretty much, not only detect, but if you wanted to do uh, automatic remediation, you can do that as well. Let's say the, the most common thing, somebody just launched an EC2 server in your AWS environment usually with the intention of perhaps uh, crypto mining or, or running some kind of uh, networking operation, uh, you know, something that shouldn't happen within your environment. Uh, in that case, you can set up an alarm uh, saying, you know, this, this server just launched and, you know, send that alert to a cell phone, for example. Or if you are like a very, very tight, uh, secure environment, you can set up automatic remediation that will send a terminate uh, instruction to this new server that, that just launched. So you can do all those things uh, just from, uh, from the AWS uh, config uh, console. Okay, good answer. We have a couple more questions in here. And they both deal with asking about low-cost solutions to protect servers from active threats. And are there any third-party solutions to protect against ransomware? And of course, that brings to mind Veeam, which has a data platform. It does backup and recovery, monitoring and analytics, recovery orchestration, and more. Is there anything more you'd like to say about that or the space in general, Carlos? Um, yes, I, I would throw in that, um, uh, for example, real-time uh, protection. Uh, one of the best and cheapest tools that you can do is perhaps deploy your application behind an AWS service, uh, let's say uh, load balancing or something like CloudFront, uh, and combine that with an auto-scaling group of spot instances. Uh, spot instances are the cheapest ones in AWS, and you can you know, scale out to those as they become available to you. And if you put a service in front, let's say a load balancer, or CloudFront, if you put those services in front of your application, now you have an entire AWS support team in front of your application to, uh, you know, to be able to, to protect yourself uh, from, you know, general active threats out there like denial of service, uh, for example. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's the solution. Okay, great. Well, it looks like that's all the questions we have time for. So, thanks again, Carlos, for an Excellent presentation and answering all those questions. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Everyone else, stay tuned. We're going to take a short break and be back at the top of the hour for our second session of the day. Modern best practice, practices for security and recovering your AWS cloud. So take this chance to check out those resources on your console provided by Veeam, and we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Chris Paoli, editor, and I am here to moderate the second session of our Ransomware Disaster Recovery and Your AWS Cloud Summit called Modern Best Practices for Security and Recovering Your AWS Cloud. Our speaker for this session is Stephen Smiley, AWS Ambassador and Consulting Director with ScaleSec. Stephen Smiley is an AWS Ambassador and Consulting Director with ScaleSec a security-first cloud consulting partner that helps enterprises create or enhance cloud programs through cloud security strategy, hands-on architecture, implementation, automation, and integration services. Take it away, Stephen. Hey, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, you know, as you said, I live and breathe AWS and cloud security, um, and so I am happy to help uh, share my lessons learned through many years of doing this. And uh, I would like to invite our attendees to please send me your questions, send me your toughest questions. I will do my best to answer them and, and help you find some additional resources. And um, even if you want to just put in the Q&A box, like, hey, what, what are you using AWS for? Or what do you hope to use it for? And let's talk about how we can do it better together. Um, so please, uh, you know, l let me know what you're thinking. Um, let's go to the next slide here. Okay. So here's our agenda today. Um, we're talking specifically about security and all the different questions that you should be asking yourself if you are in charge of securing a cloud environment. So how are we going to 
ensure comprehensive coverage of responsibilities, for example, right? That is one of the fundamental questions that we're going to be asking ourselves. But there's a bunch more, right? Like, how are we going to know if risky actions are taken? How are we going to investigate suspicious activity, right? These are the questions that we're going to go through and think about um, having a clear answer to um, before we have, you know, significant data, significant critical resources in our environment. So um, without further ado, let's get into it. We're going to address each one of these. So how are we going to um, ensure that we have comprehensive coverage of our responsibilities? We are going to build a cloud operating model. And what this starts with is a service catalog, right? What are our services? Who owns them? How important are they, right? If this is just a blog and if it goes down for three days, it doesn't matter. We should note that right? But if we've got a service that is critical that our partners rely on, we should also know that too. And we should have some idea of whether or not we're going to respond to this quickly, you know, overnight, or if it can wait until the morning, right? We also are going to include in our service catalog things like our compliance requirements. Does this store um, payment card uh, information and we need to comply with PCI DSS? Um, we should note that, right? Where are we in the development of this service? Is this just development and we're just exploring, or is this fully production? Um, it might seem initially that these things are obvious, but as your organization grows, it's really going to be beneficial to have a clear catalog of all the things that you've got. When those people that own them and built them leave, you don't want to lose track of them, right? So it starts with a service catalog. Um, after that, we want to think about our responsibilities. So specifically, how are we going to lay out security responsibilities across our organization? Um, we should probably have stream-aligned service teams, right? So that's a, a, a team that's responsible for some value stream to our business, right? It's got five to eight people maybe. Um, it's got clear boundaries that that team can handle and they've got a designated security champion. Now that team's responsible for security of their application, just like they are responsible for its reliability and its features and everything else that it's doing, they're responsible for it. But there should be one person who is making sure that they are constantly asking the tough security questions like, hey, when we make this change, um, is that gonna affect our uh, authorization and authentication flow. Um, so, so that team uh, is, is thinking about their own security. Um, we should probably also have some sort of platform team. And that platform team views those service teams as their customers. They interview them and say, what can I do to make it easier for you to, de to develop and deploy securely and reliably? Um, and then they build those things because likely they're going to find some common things across all the teams in your organization. They're going to say, well, we need a way to deploy a web application firewall, for example. Go, ah, okay, I can build you a some sort of template or some sort of tool that can do that and take that load off of your shoulders. Um, okay, so then what other teams might we have? We might have some sort of enabling team, like a cloud business office that helps develop policies and standards, priorities. We might have a central security team that is going to have visibility into all of the cloud risks across the environment and um, can then you know, call a team and say, hey, I see a risk that you haven't closed. What's the deal with this? And they'll go, oh, well, you know, we're getting to it. But they can coordinate. Um, and if our organization has some particularly complicated subsystems, we may, might also designate a team that's got specialist knowledge in that. Um, but, but ultimately, we're going to have this operating model that's got clarity on who is responsible for what. What I've seen um, go wrong in the cloud, 
And then this is not just specific to cloud, but in general, what goes wrong in technology organizations is a lack of clarity on who is responsible for what. Um, and then when a security incident happens, we're not prepared. Okay, so that is how we will ensure comprehensive coverage of our responsibilities up front. One of the first things that we're gonna start thinking about is how are we gonna maintain segmented network zones, especially as we expand and evolve. And this is not uh, specific to cloud, of course. We've been doing this on-prem for many, many years. But in the cloud, we have a lot of flexibility around our network. We can quickly create and destroy new VPCs and subnets and internet gateways, right? Routes to the internet. That's something that we're not usually used to on-prem is that a team might be able to kind of poke a hole in, in a network uh, topology. So that's one of the things that we're gonna think about early on. We're gonna think about, do we need a connection to our on-prem environment? Are we gonna keep one or, um, or is that not necessary? And then what, what are the bandwidth requirements gonna look like? But we're gonna start planning that because that's gonna be really hard to change later if we, if we need to um, create that route. We're also gonna think about IP addressing. And again, we've been doing this on-prem for a long time, but in the cloud, we're gonna think about having some sort of po global pool and maybe a regional pool, um, and then even within accounts, right? So we're gonna think about that. And AWS has a tool that helps us manage these called the IP address manager. And it will help you um, create these pools. And then when you go to create a new VPC, you don't actually tell it the specifics. You just say, hey, I need a, a subnet of this size from this pool, and it will kind of vend that to you and keep track of all of that. And it makes sure that you don't have overlaps or you know issues. So that is a great tool to, to include in this planning stage. Um, we're also gonna think about our zones as we're building that, right? Do we wanna have a zone that we're going to allow exposure to the public internet. This is where we're going to host, you know, our public services or websites, whatever it is. But that should be a very separate zone um, than where we store our customer data, for example. And so I've got on the screen here an example of a architecture that I use commonly, which is um, I have an infrastructure zone, an external zone, internal, and then customer data. And then I can use access control lists to carefully limit traffic that goes across that. So if you compromise a public service of mine, which I'm of course gonna defend against, but it might happen, you will not be able to directly send traffic to my customer data services. And that's important to me because I'm gonna take extra care in safeguarding my customer's data. Okay, I'm also gonna be thinking about do I need um, a central inspection point, right? Like a, a, a network firewall. Um, these, are, these are services that we've been doing on-prem for a long time. They have come into the cloud mostly through, um, you know, installing appliances uh, kind of on a virtual machine. Um, the cloud is starting to develop services around this. So AWS does have a network firewall service that can do much of um, this central inspection that you need. We may decide that we don't need TLS inspection. We don't need to break apart our encrypted packets, but that's probably where the most important data exists. So we are gonna think about how do we set up TLS inspection and how do we route all of our traffic that's leaving our network to all go through these endpoints for inspection before they go out. Um, you know, this, this is important if you're concerned about something being compromised and then being, um, and then attempting to uh, exfiltrate data uh, out of your network, for example, or, you know, phone home to some command and control um, system. So, uh, so we're going to think about this network topology because, again, this is going to be really hard to change later if we, if we decide that we want to do it differently. Um, you'll, you'll also see in this diagram that I have come to really appreciate a shared VPC model in AWS. So I've got a VPC that's spanning multiple accounts. We see account A, B, C, and D. 
and the subnets can be shared with these other accounts um, in a way that this allows us to have central control of a uh, of a VPC and its subnets, but make them accessible to a team that's deploying um, into them. Um, and they do not have the responsibility to manage that network. And they also can't, right? Because I don't want them to be creating new routes and new ways to the internet, for example. I want to say, you know, you are only allowed to um, put resources into this subnet. And so um, this is a model I've come to really uh, pr prefer if I can. Um, it also has lots of uh, cost savings as well that we that we could get into if, if you'd like. Um, but plan out your network topology and be prepared to expand and evolve. Okay, so we've got uh, we've got an operating model. We've got our network. We're ready to deploy some some workloads. We're going to start thinking about how do we safely and reliably deploy them. Well, when you're new to AWS, you're going to go into the web console and you're going to start exploring the services and see how they work. That is a great way to get familiar with AWS and how AWS expects you to use a service. But it is not the way that you want to deploy a production quality workload. You really want to deploy that with code. You want to define your infrastructure using some tool. You want to make deployments, you know, iterative and have different environments, right? So you can, at its most basic level, have a development environment and then go to production. But you may also roll out across multiple regions or staging environments, things like that. Um, I have on the screen here an example of one of the more complicated ways that you could do this, right, where you're going from a tool chain account to a beta and then a gamma production across many regions. Um, this is probably overkill for most uses, but, um, but you want to have some plan of what this flow is going to look like. So you'll want to pick some infrastructure as code tool, and we can talk about the options out there and their trade-offs. Um, but one of the things that you'll – there's many benefits that you'll get out of taking this approach. One of them is this is going to enable collaboration, right? So your teams can see each other's code and the changes that they're making. It also enables review. So when somebody wants to make – propose a change, they can propose a change just like they are doing for application code and um, get some feedback and then approve it. It also allows – auditing of these changes. You can see who made the change and why. And along the way, you're also going to get history of those changes. You have the ability to quickly roll back if you make an error and you know what the change was. You have accountability, right, of who made a change. And um, in the event that something happens to your environment, like it gets, to gets totally wiped out, you can recover and reproduce that environment because you have the full set of code needed to deploy it. And that's important because if you're if you spend years building out a custom environment and somehow it gets destroyed one way or another, your business might be completely wiped out if you cannot reproduce that quickly. Right? So this is an existential threat. Um, so infrastructure as code is essentially non-negotiable for a production level workload. Okay. So we've got we've got some uh, some workloads planned. One of the things that we want to start thinking about is how will we provide access and maintain least privilege. When we start in the environment, we are likely going to give full administrator access to a few key people, and maybe a few other people will get some read level access. But in between those, it's very uncommon and kind of difficult to figure out exactly what the least um, privileges are. And I think you should strive to limit those permissions. But one of the ways that I have come to really um, find balances, you know, providing access without blocking people, maintaining least privilege, is to have a, a, a request and approval workflow. And oftentimes, organizations do this with some sort of ticketing system where you put in a ticket and someone goes in and adds it. 
and maybe they remember to come back and remove it later, but probably not, right? Instead, let's use a purpose-built tool for this. So there are some commercial options out there, but I also wanted to share um, some, some open source and, and some, some tools that are available out there in the community. One of them is actually was recently published by AWS itself as a sample project called Temporary Elevated Access Management, or TEAM. And as you can see on the screen here, it gives a user the ability to request access to a specific account with a specific role for a start time and a duration of hours, and they get to put in their justification. And maybe they even mention the ticket that they are responding to. Um, and then somebody will get an email that gets to approve that. And that approver might be a peer of theirs, and that's okay, because at least it took two people to allow this access. Or maybe that approver is a manager of some sort who keeps track, but that's up to you. Um, but you get to manage what can be act, uh, requested and how it gets approved, and this is a great way to limit access. There's other tools. Common Fate is developing a very similar product, as I, I mentioned before. Um, SimOps is one of the other players in this space where they um, are using uh, uh, Terraform in combination with um, essentially Python uh, workflows that can provide some advanced functionality and like integration, for example, where it'll check, oh, that this person is on call, so they uh, they get auto-approved access because it checked pager duty and can see that they're on call. So you can evaluate a few options here, but I think this is something that in the future we will say is non-negotiable for secure access, and we should get on board with this. Okay, so we've got some access, but we're also going to think about how will we safely access our instances, not just the AWS environment, but our instances. How are we going to manage them? Um, and in AWS, um, the the preferred tool for this is, is Systems Manager. And I think that some people use Systems Manager, but it's still highly underutilized because for the most part, people are still thinking in terms of um, on-prem infrastructure and just SSHing directly into instances or using you know RDP, um, things like that. But Systems Manager is very powerful. And if you get it set up the way that you want, um, it, it works quite well. Uh, it's even easier than ever to roll it out across your environment because you can now create a default host management configuration that will apply to everything in an account, and you don't actually need to um, create, attach an instance profile or instance role um, to instances like you used to. Um, and so that, that removes one of the more difficult steps. Um, but once you've got that, you get a bunch of key capabilities. So one of them is patch management, where you can establish a patch policy or patch baseline that say, I want to scan for you know, critical and security patches within the last seven days for these operating systems. And if it doesn't have it, please you know, surface that into my reporting as critical. Um, but you can also say, I would like to just automatically patch that. And, and you can do it on a schedule if it's during a maintenance window, or you can say, hey, go patch this right now. Um, but set this up. The defaults are actually very good, so it doesn't take very much setup at all. Um, it just requires that um, your instances are managed by Systems Manager. So they've got the agent on there. Um, and then... Um, You've got solid patch management, and this is free, right? You don't have to pay for uh, an additional patch management service. One of the other things you're going to get is session manager. So this allows you to connect via SSH or RDP. And critically, you do not need to open those ports. So you're not opening three, you know, port 22 for SSH, for example. Um, and um, instead, the agent makes a call out of that instance to the systems manager service. And so you can access these directly when needed. You, sh you should also consider that that provides some risk, right? 
because if you don't want your developers directly SSHing in with privileged access, then you're going to want to limit those permissions. Um, but this is a lot better than having um, uh, port 22 open and they're, they're logging in. You may also use the systems manager run command capability. If you need to run a specific command, maybe that's a PowerShell script or, um, you know, whatever your scripts are, um, you can run those kind of ad hoc and say, I need this to run um, to, you know, patch some particular issue. Um, you may also use uh, a maintenance window to schedule a run command to happen every Friday, for example. Um, but uh, you can you can run whatever commands you'd like. You can also use Change Manager for um, approval for request and approval of changes, where you define a run book and let people um, you know request and approve those. So there's a bunch of built-in run books like restarting an instance, um, or you know there's a number of things. But uh, or you can even write your own run books. But this is a way of you know providing a workflow so that uh, operations teams can um, affect these instances, but not directly. Right? They have to work with a, a peer. And then the last capability I wanted to point out is its ability to inventory what's on an instance. So that would include its packages and um, its, its, its system um, you know, versions and so forth. Um, this can be super useful in keeping track of what you've got. And when it comes time to say, uh-oh, there's a new vulnerability and it affects this package, which of our instances have it? Well, boom, I can go to inventory and I can figure that out right away. I don't need to, you know, log into each one and figure it out. So Systems Manager is awesome, and I would definitely um, recommend checking it out. When it comes to which documents and run commands would I suggest, I'm seeing a question in the Q&A here. Um, you know, go through the list and see which of these are useful, but um, common ops tasks are, are included in there. Restarting instances, backing up volumes, um, attaching volumes, or, or moving them around. Um, so so there's, there's a number of those. But I also recommend, um, you know, considering what your needs are and writing your own run books. That's not difficult to do. You can provide it as an AWS CLI command or various other uh, mechanisms. But, um, but you can write your own run books for exactly what you need. And you can even run those step by step. So one of the steps might be that you're asserting a state of some variable before you proceed to change it, right? Which is safe and um, and would really help. So if you find yourself doing particular tasks commonly, write that as a safe run book um, and include that as a change manager kind of change template. And uh, that will really improve your workflow. Okay. So We've got our network set up. We've got some secure access through our, you know, our workflows. We even have patch management and our infrastructure management. Okay, let's think about our backups because how are we going to protect this important data that we are that we're handling from destructive activity? And that destructive activity might be accidental. It might be malicious, either insider threat or external or whatever. But we don't want to be um, caught without good backups, right? And our sponsor today, Veeam, is a you know perfectly suitable solution that I see, and I'm sure that they will talk about um, their solution versus the AWS native solution. But the AWS native solution is a capable solution. Um, I have on the screen here the architecture that I tend to use um, because I think it's important for us to have cross-account backup. So we're sending our backups to another account where they can't be tampered with. Um, I also think that it's important to protect that vault using um, a vault access policy that's on that vault, like who can change it and, and under what conditions, um, and a service control policy. So an identity-based policy will um, affect the identity to say, you can't take these actions. So even if you are 
a full admin in this account, my service control policy will deny you the ability to delete things out of my back, you know, out of my backup vault, or affect my plan so that I uh, am no longer taking uh, <clears throat> the, the, the backups that I uh, were that I was planning on. Um, you can also even consider the AWS Backup Vault Lock feature, which allows you to set a minimum and maximum retention period. So if you set a minimum retention period and this backup is taken, nobody can delete that backup. I mean, nobody can. Um, so if you do that, uh, you, you do have to consider, you know, the impact of that, right? Like that might incur some cost because you're going to pay for that backup to be stored. Um, but also, uh, if, a, if, an, if a ransomware actor tries to get in and, um, you know, encrypt your data, you know for sure that you've got a backup um, ready. And then the last part of my backup plan that I'm considering here is alerts on risky actions. So many of these actions we are trying to are trying our best to deny, but we also want to have an alert when someone tries to do that. So if someone tries to change my backup plan or delete a backup or something like that, I want to be notif notified because um, that's a risky action. And it might be um, a totally safe thing that we want to do, but it might also be indication of a potential compromise. So that's going to be part of my backup plan. All right. So we've got we've got secure backups. We've been thinking about risk alerting. Um, what other risks? should we be alerting on, right? And how are we going to know? So one of the one of the biggest risks <laughs> that we want to be thinking about is our budget and cost. We should be setting up AWS budgets so that we get notified um, if we're spending more money than we expect. That is That could be totally accidental. That could be just part of our normal business. Um, but it also could be an indication that somebody is spinning up resources that we do not want. And so that could be a security issue. Um, so let's have some budgets on first. The other thing that we want to be thinking about are actions that would have long-term effects or expensive effects. Um, so by default, if you're an administrator, you can do a number of things that would cost a lot of money. For example, subscribing to services in the AWS marketplace or committing to spend, like creating a savings plan or purchasing reserved instances. And there's very good reasons to do these things, but if I buy a three-year reserved instance plan, um, we're gonna get, and, and I say I'm gonna pay for that all up front, we are gonna get a massive bill and we should be prepared for that. So I tend to deny these actions with a service control policy until we know we wanna do this and we have some um, process for it. We also want to be thinking about um, backups. So if a bad actor wanted to, you know, hurt us and make us pay a bunch of money, they could create a backup vault or uh, lock a bunch of S3 objects. And again, there would be no way to undo that. Um, and we would be on the hook for paying that money unless we had to, you know, negotiate with AWS if there was an issue. So these are kind of long-term effect actions that I want to have very carefully controlled. There's a bunch of other risky events that we want to, you know, potentially deny or just be alerted on. Things like someone logged in as a root user and they're taking action. Um, the, someone's trying to change our cloud trail configuration. Uh, why would we want to stop logging? Why would we want to delete that trail? Maybe we're making a you know a planned change. That's okay, but um, that happens very rarely. Someone's creating a new IAM user. Well, we don't use IAM users in our environment because we always use single sign-on because we know that's the best practice. So let's be alerted if someone tries to create a new user because they might be trying to create persistent access. Um, we should be alerted if someone's deactivating MFA devices or deleting them. Now that could be in the course of a you know a user just setting up their uh, uh, in their access the way that they like, um, but it also could be the result of uh, you know compromise. So let's look out for that. Um, if we see massive numbers of access denied or unauthorized operation events, um, then we should take a look at that because it could be somebody you know 
they got access to a least privilege role and they are trying to figure out what they're able to do. So they're just trying a bunch of actions. Um, let's take a look at that. Or if someone's um, failing to log into the console, that could be benign or it could be somebody who um, is trying to, to break in. So um, think about risk alert. Uh, you, you may have a SIM of some sort that can do this, but um, if, if not, you can also just do this in CloudWatch log. And there's a, there's a starter kit out there, the AWS Security Survival Kit that will get you started. Um, and I'd be happy to help you set up um, your own uh, risk alerting. Okay, so for more advanced threat detection, we can consider the AWS uh, service of, of guard duty. So guard duty is going to use Amazon's, you know, threat intelligence and their more advanced uh, analytics looking at VPC flow logs and, you know, DNS queries and, um, you know, much more detailed information than just uh, management events. And they will surface some findings for us like, um, you know, unauthorized access is happening, or there's a, you know, malicious software on this, uh, on this instance. So, um, if we have production environments, we should have this on. You know, Amazon has very good threat intelligence, and these findings um, can be very helpful for us in investigating things. Um, so, we should have this on our production accounts, if not all of them. Um, but really importantly, is we're going to think about our cloud operating model and say, who is responsible for investigating and tuning these? Because what I see too often is that uh, organizations enable this, but they have nobody looking at it. So they've just got months of you know findings that were not responded to. Um, that provides no value whatsoever, right? If there was an attacker in there that they're not being stopped by this. Um, AWS does provide some really helpful playbooks. Uh, I've got the link on the screen here, the incident response playbook where, um, you know, it, the, the, the first phase is going to be preparation. So you're going to look at each of these playbooks and think about the preparation steps and how they apply to your environment. But um, having these ready in case you do encounter an event, um, you can use these to work through it. In fact, this, um, this reference has them aligned to specific guard duty alerts. So you may not know too much about the alert, but you can just work through this playbook and it'll help you know what to investigate um, and how, how you might want to contain and re remediate uh, the, the issue if it is uh, a legitimate issue. So if you don't have your own playbooks, um, this is a great starting point. Um, guard duty continues to get better. Its service coverage keeps increasing. So um, malware protection for EC2 was recently um, released where it can actually look, you know, closer to the to the instance and find malware on there. It's also protect, protecting uh, managed databases using RDS Aurora. Um, even going down to the Kubernetes service, it can look at the user and app activity. It's covering S3 and you know um, potentially malicious activity there. Um, and then, and now it's even looking at Lambda. Um, so guard duty is something that. Uh, we should definitely be including um, across the board in production environment. So we've got some threat detection, risky actions. We, we've got um, in, intelligent threat detection set up. But when it comes time to investigate, how are we going to investigate whether or not this is a real threat or if it's, um, you know, benign, right? So we need to be prepared to query our logs somehow, somehow. Big organizations tend to have um, some sort of SIM system which ingests a number of logs, and that is a perfectly suitable solution that you can send your AWS logs to. But if you don't have that, you should still have some way of doing it. CloudTrail by itself, you can do a simple query um, of like, the last 90 days, and you can look at one dimension, so you can say, show me all the events that are console login, right? Um, and that can be helpful for very simple investigation. But it's not going to be helpful if I need to say, well, show me console logins 
in this time period, in this region, or show me, you know, people who um, did multiple actions, right? And you're trying to correlate things and look at multiple dimensions. And those are things that any uh, incident responder is going to start doing right away. So that's not possible just in CloudTrail. You can send your CloudTrail logs to CloudWatch logs, where you can um, you can query them there and you can set up metric alarms. So that is that is one solution. Unfortunately, CloudWatch logs gets pretty expensive if you retain them for a long period in there. So maybe you just want to retain them for a short time um, for your metric alarms, like a week or something like that. Um, but then retain them in S3 or something for a uh, longer archival purposes. And then the the more recent releases are AWS provides the CloudTrail Lake service where you can query using standard SQL query language. Um, and, uh, and and this is a great option for, um, for doing that. They even provide some sample queries for common um, investigation purposes. And again, this is not just for security, but just in general, right? Like as, a, as an architect, I might query this to see what um, what errors am I getting with IAM, right? I created a service, I gave it a, what I thought was a least privileged role. Something's not working. I need to see what the denial reason is, something like that. Um, so I need a way to look at those logs. Um, uh, AWS does have a security lake service that um, takes a lot more setup and consideration. We can talk about that if you'd like, um, but it's not going to be the go-to for querying logs unless you, you know, really uh, build that up. The other thing to note is that when you enable CloudTrail, you get some options to enable data events from like S3 and Lambda. Um, if you don't include these, then you're going to store a lot less logs but you're also not going to have visibility into some key actions. So, for example, um, you need to enable S3 data events if you want to see when an object was retrieved or overwritten or placed into a bucket. And um, depending on your threat model, that might be very important, right? So, if, if you're hosting a website in S3 and somebody gets access to your account, and they modify an object, right, a file in, in S3, um, you won't have any log of that. <laughs> so uh, I do think that it's important to enable CloudTrail data events to, uh, to have full visibility into your logs in your environment. Okay, so uh, we've covered a number of things, and I am very excited to take your question. But overall, these are the questions we need to be asking ourselves if we are securing and recovering our AWS environment? You know, how are we going to ensure comprehensive coverage of our responsibilities? How are we planning our network zones and being ready to expand and evolve? How are we safely and reliably deploying our workloads, specifically with infrastructure as code? How are we controlling our access? How are we managing our instances and, and accessing them safely? How are we protecting our important data? particularly from destructive activity? And how are we going to know if there's risky actions or misuse, abuse of our resources? And when that happens, how are we going to investigate it, right? If we can answer all of these questions with confident, you know, clear um, people, process, and technology, then we are ready to operate our environment at a high level but if there's something missing, let's bring it up. Let's figure out how we're going to do it and have a plan because we don't want to find out when it's too late. So um, I am now very excited to take any of your questions. Um, I hope that this has been helpful. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Let's uh, jump into the questions. And for everybody uh, tuning in today, uh, we do have some extra time. So get those questions in for Stephen, and uh, we'll see how many we get through. Um, Let's jump into the first question. Uh, can you use a shared VPC with Transit Getaway? Gateway, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, yeah. So um, I, as I showed in um, in a previous slide, I'm a big fan of shared VPCs 
I like their their ability to con, you know control the network at a central level, but then vend them out to teams um, to use. And um, in AWS, a VPC belongs to a region. So uh, if you do operate in multiple regions, then you're likely going to want you you, you might need to connect those different VPCs in each region. So you'd have a shared one in each region. And the way to connect those would be with a transit gateway. Um, so so that, that works well. And then your transit gateway would also be the hub for a VPN or a direct connect, like a hybrid connection to on-prem. Um, and, so, and so you can use those together. The model that I have come to you know, avoid if possible is using a transit gateway then with many, many, like hundreds of VPCs across many accounts and many regions, it gets quickly unwieldy um, with like how many IP address ranges we have to keep track of and how are they routing to each other. Um, that is a model that I have, I have found uh, leads to a lot of problem in, in network management. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, here's a great question from John. Uh, what's the difference between Cloud Trail Lake and Security Lake? That is a good question. I don't like the way that these were set up um, and, and you know named by AWS, but that's where we are. Um, so Cloud Trail Lake is really purpose built for querying Cloud Trail, and uh, I believe you can also put some other types of logs in there. But it's really not suitable for putting like all your logs. Like you're not gonna send application logs or system logs or network flow. You're not gonna put everything in there and then query them all in the same place. Um, if you do wanna do that, you're probably gonna look to some sort of third party SIM um, or you can kind of build your own SIM using Security Lake. So Security Lake will help you normalize the fields of, that, um, of those logs and uh, get them all in the same place. Um, but it doesn't provide the front end for you to query them. So you would still use some sort of query engine. And that could actually be a third-party SIM. Like, so, so technically, like, if Splunk was your SIM, for example, just to pick one of the big names, um, you could use Splunk to query your security like once you've got your logs in there. And that might save you some cost because you're not paying Splunk to store and archive those logs. Um, but, you, but you also might choose to use any other, you know, uh, query or analytics tool, or even Amazon Athena, for example, if you want a SQL front end to those. Um, so Security Lake is much more of a building block to creating your own SIM than it is um, a full service. Yeah. Okay, great. Um... What's the best infrastructure as code tool? So that's a good question. It's going to be hotly debated. Um, you know, the AWS provides the CloudFormation. It's a service, really. So it, it, it manages the deployment and it provides you, you know, the, the templating language. Um, Cloud, CloudFormation has come a long way. It, it got a bad rap a few years ago, um, you know, compared to its the, Competitor Terraform, um, but CloudFormation has come has come a long way. I think has improved a lot. Um, at AWS, however, almost all new projects are being started in the Cloud Development Kit (AWS CDK), and CDK transpiles to CloudFormation, so you can write it in Python or TypeScript or even if you're, you know, really crazy C sharp or Java or something like that. Um, and then it will output cloud formation um, and, and deploy that way. So that is, that has become my preferred tool as well, because I'm very comfortable in those languages and there's a number of other um, advantages. So for example, it has a, uh, it has a concept of like a level two construct, which combines, um, many smaller pieces and provides uh, a bunch of sane and like secure default. So um, it can make you much more productive. Um, you still have to consider all of the impacts of like what you're deploying, however. Um, and then the other one to mention is Terraform, which is 
you know, probably the biggest name in infrastructure is code. Um, and uh, that's a perfectly suitable tool. And especially if you are controlling um, resources in many different environments, so not just AWS, but other clouds or other SaaS products, and you want to do that with the same tool, um, then Terraform is, uh, is a great tool as well. Uh, I really don't think that you can go wrong with any of these. You just need to learn it well and be productive with it and kind of stick to it, um, and, and you'll be successful. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, we just received this question in. Uh, what minimal subset would you recommend as best practice for an early stage startup with no full-time DevOps engineers? So um, it's a good question. What I would say is whatever your engineers are comfortable with is something that they should stick with, right? You are an early stage startup and uh, you just want to get product market fit and get this working. Um, so I wouldn't worry about um, getting too advanced with things. Um, the One of the other considerations that you're going to think about, though, is that if you're an early startup, you want to try to save cost, right? And you want to be ready to scale when you do get a bunch of bigger customers. Um, and in AWS, the go-to way to do that is by using their serverless capabilities. So AWS Lambda, for example, is uh, the, the the best place to start with with that. Um, and you know, have it, have, having API gateways that call Lambda functions. You're not paying for them while they're just sitting there, um, and then they can scale up instantly. Um, so that is a great place to start. And so then really the, the best way to deploy that is using um, uh, DDK or even um, the AWS serverless application model, also known as SAM, which is mm -hmm. kind of an extension of CloudFormation, um, and doing that through some sort of pipeline. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk more about how to set up that pipeline. But once you get it set up, um, you shouldn't need to, to mess with it too much later. Um, so that's that's the way that I would start. If your team is more comfortable using container-based deployments, um, then I would look at the AWS uh, Elastic Container Service, ECS, um, because that's going to provide the most no-nonsense way to deploy scalable containers on AWS. Um, I do not recommend for an early stage startup to get into EKS. That, that's the Kubernetes service um, that is likely to explode in complexity. And uh, many, many startups have made that mistake thinking uh, that, that they're eventually going to want Kubernetes. And then they just end up wasting a lot of time and money chasing down um, infrastructure problems. So, yeah, that's my recommendation. Great. Uh, let's get a couple more questions in before the end of the session here. Um, how can I ensure my environment meets specific compliance requirements? Good question. Um, so I deal with compliance a good amount for anything from FedRAMP to PCI to SOC2, um, ITAR. There's a, there's a number of different um, compliance frameworks that, that I've worked with. and. Um, for the most part, they look for the same kinds of controls. Uh, I don't find it to be that difficult, but what I do is I, you know, keep a pretty good frame, you know, idea of my framework and all the controls that I need to meet and, and map those out. Um, uh, AWS does have some services that will help you um, check for compliance. So Security Hub, for example, is going to have a a standards pack that's aligned to specific compliance frameworks. Um, and that can be helpful for providing evidence to an auditor that says, hey, look, you know, we are doing all of these checks. Um, and that, that can be very helpful. Um, it can also be really noisy if you don't need all of those checks. So I like to customize that um, to kind of improve the signal to noise ratio. Um, and uh, when, you know, when you're thinking about compliance, you're also going to want to go another layer deeper. So not just the AWS plane, but also down into my application. Like how am I encrypting or tokenizing data, for example? 
Um, and uh, and that's where you're going to want to you know, probably get with a services partner. ScaleSec, we do this all the time, um, and, and we know how to dig in and, and help you get uh, get compliant. <clears throat> Okay, great. Let's uh, let's do one more question here, and I think I might know the answer to this one. Uh, should we be using Security Hub? Oh yeah. See, like this is one that everybody talks about. Um, you know, it comes up a lot because I think AWS makes it seem even better than it is. Um, because Security Hub's doing a bunch of checks, right? It's, it's ultimately it's orchestrating a, a config rule on your behalf. Um, my complaint with it is that it's very noisy uh, because it's going to give you checks like, hey, you need hardware MFA. And you're like, well, I don't need hardware MFA. I prefer virtual MFA, and that's just as good, right? Or it might say, like, you need to um, you need to have, a, you know, encryption on this bucket. Well, that bucket has nothing important in it. I really don't care. Um, so, you know, so please don't, you know, complain to me about that, right? Um, so I personally don't use it uh, unless, you know, I really need an, an easy solution, and I instead build custom kind of config rules that are targeted to what is important in my environment with the right, like, inclusions and exclusions so that I don't get notified unless there's an actual issue. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, thanks for the great, uh, great talk, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me today.